McLuhan, I don't know how many of you recall him from the 60s, but he had, for a very brief period of time, about five or six years, an extraordinary influence on American culture. Uh, you couldn't pick up a magazine or turn on the TV without hearing McLuhan, McLuhan, what he said, what he thought, what he predicted. He was consulting with Madison Avenue, with politicians, with Hollywood, um, so forth and so on. And it, his influence, he died in the early 70s, and his influence died with him even though he had uh, founded the Center for Media Study at the University of Toronto in Canada, he really seemed to spawn no highly visible successors. It was a unique um, personality and breakthrough, much in the same way that Joyce was a unique personality and, uh, and spawned very few imitators. And the irony of all this is that McLuhan did his journeyman work before he burst onto the world stage as this mysterious savant of media. He did his work as a Joyce scholar. That's what he was, a literary critic, Joyce scholar, medievalist, that sort of thing. And then in the early 50s or middle 50s, he wrote a book, which I've never read, it's very hard to find, called The Mechanical Bride, that was his first testing of his um, ideas. Uh, McLuhan is primarily understood as a communication theorist or a philosopher of media, and that's what he talked about. He turned the analytical Western deconstructionist method on the technologies of communication, uh, printing, film, photography, dance, theater, even such things as uh, money he thought of as, t as forms of media. And he carried out and analyzed these various forms of media and reached uh, very controversial uh, conclusions. One of the things that was puzzling to me as I went back through and read all this is one of the things was McLuhan was synonymous with incomprehensibility in the 60s. I mean, the whole thing was, who can understand this guy? You know, he's like Buddha. He speaks these words, but we can't understand. Well, now, 25, 30 years later, it reads pretty straightforwardly. And uh, most of what he predicted has come to pass. I think even McLuhan would be amazed at the speed with which the Gutenberg world has been overturned. I mean, there's no hint in here of home computers, let alone interactive networks, virtual reality, uh, phone sex and so forth and so on but these were this was all grist for the McLuhan-esque mill and he would have had he lived had much to say on this it surprised me in reading this stuff how um, demanding it is on your own um, literacy I mean you basically he assumes basically that the people he's talking to have read everything <laughs> and have understood it. I mean, from Homer to Rabelais to Chaucer to Mad Magazine, he assumes you have a complete knowledge of modern film and popular print journalism and popular culture. All of this was grist for his mill. Um, I'll show you the books I'm reading from and talking about, and then I'll actually read you a section of McLuhan because it's a... Like Joyce, it's a stylistic thing that you can't really uh, encompass without getting your feet wet. Uh, this was his m best known book, probably, and this is the or original paperback edition. This book was Im immensely discussed when it came out and probably very little read, judging by the quality of the discussion. Understanding media, the extensions of man. This is how most people heard of uh, McLuhan. And he followed it up 
with um, the Gutenberg Galaxy. These are all first editions. These books, I don't think, are in print. Few intellectuals in this century have fallen so totally through the cracks uh, as McLuhan. The Gutenberg Galaxy, very interesting. I'm going to read from it, some of it tonight. It's organized around uh, chapter headings such as does the interiorization of media such as letters alter the ratio among our senses and change mental processes? Or um, Pope's Dunciad indicates the printed book as the agent of a primitivistic and romantic revival Sheer visual quantity evokes the magical resonance of the tribal horde. The box office looms as a return to the echo chamber of bardic incantation. That's a chapter heading. Um, <laughs> topography cracked the voices of silence. And one of my favorite, Heidegger surfboards along on the electronic wave as triumphantly as Descartes rode the mechanical wave. So there's a lot of fun in McLuhan, and this comes out of his being a Joyce scholar. Uh, you just can't mess with that without fun. This is uh, his third book with Harley Parker, Through the Vanishing Point, Space in Poetry and Painting. And I guess I should say, I, a few years ago, somebody asked me to review McLuhan's letters which had been published, which I did. It was a uh, Gnosis or somebody. Anyway, uh, it brought back to me, uh, he was a convert to Catholicism and an extraordinarily complex intellectual uh, with uh, a medievalist who became a Joyce scholar, who became a communications expert. And in McLuhan, there is a very deep strain of nostalgia for the essence of the medieval world, of what he called manuscript culture. And essentially, his entire output is a critique of print and of the impact of print on uh, culture. And I think, though he attempted to be fairly even-handed, his final resolution of all this was that it had it had had many many de detrimental and distorting effects uh, on the Western mind. This is another little book he published back in the heyday, and he experimented with topographic layout, uh, somewhat hearkening back to s the surrealists, whom he discusses a great deal. Uh, and there was something about, it was his fascination with topographical layout that also brought him into such congruence with, uh, with the wake. So let me read you a section from the Gutenberg Galaxy that is both interesting to think about, or, if you can't understand it, then an interesting example of uh, what McLuhan's style was like and what I mean by that he was an extraordinarily demanding intellectual. He doesn't cut you much slack. This is a short section called Only a Fraction of the History of Literacy Has Been Typographic. Till now, we have been concerned mostly with the written word as it transfers or translates the audio tactile space of sacral non-literate man into the visual space of civilized or literate or profane man. Once this transfer or metamorphosis occurs, we are soon in the world of books, scribal or typographic. The rest of our concern will be with books, written and printed, and the results for learning and society. From the 5th century BC to the 15th century AD, the book was a scribal product. Only one-third of the history of the book in the Western world has been typographic. It is not incongruous, therefore, to say, as G.S. Brett does in Psychology Ancient and Modern, and here's the quote, the idea that knowledge is essentially book learning seems to be a very modern view, 
probably derived from the medieval distinctions between clerk and layman, with additional emphasis provided by the literary character of the rather fantastic humanism of the 16th century. The original and natural idea of knowledge is that of cunning or the possession of wits. Odysseus is the, is the original type of thinker, a man of many ideas who could overcome the cyclops and achieve a significant triumph of mind over matter. Knowledge is thus a capacity for overcoming the difficulty of, difficulties of life and achieving success in this world. So that closes the quote. Then McLuhan comments, Brett here specifies the natural dichotomy which the book brings into any society. In addition to the split within the individual of that society, the work of James Joyce exhibits a complex clairvoyance in these matters. His Leopold Bloom of Ulysses, a man of many ideas and many devices, is a freelance salesman. Joyce saw the parallels, on one hand, between the modern frontier of the verbal and the pictorial, and, on the other, between the Homeric world poised between the old sacral culture and the new profane or literate sensibility. Bloom, the newly detribalized Jew, is presented in modern Dublin, a slightly detribalized Irish world, such a frontier is the modern world of the advertisement, congenial, therefore, to the, trans to the transitional culture of Bloom. In the 17th or Ithaca episode of Ulysses, we read, What were habitually his final meditations of some one sole unique advertisement? to cause passers to stop in wonder, a poster novelty with all extraneous accretions excluded, reduced to its simplest and most efficient terms, not exceeding the span of casual vision and congruous with the velocity of modern life. In the books at the wake, James S. Atherton points out, and here's Atherton's quote, amongst other things, Finnegan's Wake is a history of writing, we begin with writing on a bone, a pebble, a ram skin, leave them to cook in the mothering pot, and Gutenberg with his Cro-Magnon charter, tinting fats and great prime, must once for omnibus step rubric red out of the word press. The mothering pot is an allusion to alchemy, but there is some other significance connected with writing, for the next time the word appears, it is again in a context concerning improvement in a system of in systems of communication the passage is all the erish signics of her dip and dump help a bit from and father hogum told the mutter maskins dip and dump help a bit combine the deaf and dumb alphabet signs in the air or erish signs with the ups and downs of the ordinary ABC and the more pronounced up and downs of Irish Ogham writing. The mason following this must be the man of that name who invented steel pen nibs. But all I can suggest for mother is the mothering of Freemasons which does not fit the context, although they, of course, also make signs in the air. Is that perfectly clear? <laughs> Now back to McLuhan. Gutenberg, with his Cro-Magnon charter, expounds by mythic gloss the fact that writing meant the emergence of the caveman or sacral man from the audio world of simultaneous resonance into the profane world of daylight. The reference to the masons is to the world of the bricklayer as a type of speech itself. On the second page of The Wake, Joyce is making a mosaic, an Achilles shield, as it were, of all the themes and modes of human speech and communication. Big Meister Finnegan of the stuttering hand, Freeman's Maurer lived in the broadest way immarginable in his rush lit too far back for massages before Joshuan judges had given us numbers. Joyce is, in the wake, 
making his own Altamira cave drawings of the entire history of the human mind in terms of its basic gestures and postures during all phases of human culture and technology. As his title indicates, he saw that the wake of human progress can disappear again into the night of sacral or auditory man. The fin cycle of tribal institutions can return in the electric age, but if again, then let's make it awake, or awake, or both. Joyce could see no advantage in our remaining locked up in each cultural cycle as in a trance or dream. He discovered the means of living simultaneously in all cultural modes while quite conscious. This means he cites for such self-awareness and correction of cultural bias in his kaleidoscope. This term indicates the interplay in colloidal mixture of all components of human technology as they extend our senses and shift their ratios in the social kaleidoscope of cultural clash, deor, savage, the oral or sacral, scope, the visual or profane and civilized. So that's his comment. Only a fraction of the history of literacy has been typographic. These people, Joyce, um, to some degree, Pound, um, McLuhan, they were the prophets of the world in which we now stand. The world of uh, integrated, interactive media, extraordinary data retrieval that erases the 17th century notion of the unconscious. Nothing is now unconscious if your data search commands are powerful enough. And uh, the, the remaking of the human image that required centuries for print, the transition that we talked about in here from scribal culture to true book culture occupied 500 years. The transition from book culture to electronic culture has occurred in less than 50 years. I mean, it, it's eerie to read his examples of contemporaneity because there's stuff like Marilyn Monroe, Perry Como, James Dean. I mean, he's writing from another era, and yet, from his point of view, he's firmly embedded in a kind of super future that we are um, now able to look back on. Here's another section that I think makes some of this more clear. The name of this section is, The medieval book trade was a second-hand trade even as with the dealing today in old masters. From the 12th century onward, the rise of the universities brought masters and students into the field of book production in class time, and these books found their way back to the monastic libraries when students returned after completing their studies. A number of these standard textbooks, which of which approved exemplars were kept for copying by the stationari of the universities, naturally found their way into print quite early, for many of them contained in undiminished request in the 15th century as before. These u official university texts offer no problems of origin or nomenclature. And then he's quoting Goldschmidt. He adds, soon after 1300, the expensive vellum could be dispensed with and the cheaper paper made the accumulation of many books a matter of industry rather than wealth. Since, however, the student went to lectures pen in hand and it was the lecturer's task to dictate the book he was expounding to his audience, there is a great body of reporterata which constitute a very complex problem for editors. So really, like for Joyce, for McLuhan, the book is the central symbol of the age, the central mystery of our time. In a sense, I sort of share that notion. It's a very Talmudic 
notion. It's a very psychedelic notion. It's the idea that somehow the career of the word is the central overarching uh, metaphor of the age. And naturally, if the book is the central metaphor for reality, then reality itself is seen as somehow literary, somehow textual. And this, in fact, is how I think reality was seen until the rise of modern science. The, uh, we're always taught, you know, that the roots of modern science go back to Democritian atomism, which is, of course, true. But the number of people who knew that a thousand years ago was probably very few. Uh, the, the, the real uh, notion out of which science had to divest itself is the notion uh, of a book, or if that seems too concrete, a story, a narrative, the story of man's fall and redemption. That was what the Christian exegesis of, uh, of uh, post-Edenic time was all about. With the rise of modern science, the idea of narrative has become somewhat overthrown. Uh, McLuhan would say that narrative persisted far beyond its utility because the um, biases of print kept it in place for much, such a long time. Everyone assumes that tools are tools and you use them and that's that. For McLuhan, the entirety of the toolkit of, wa of modern Western man can be traced to the unconscious assumptions of print. For example, the idea of the, of the individual which is a pretty personal notion right there in close to the heart. The idea of the individual is a post-medieval concept legitimized by print. The idea of the public, this concept did not exist before uh, newspapers because before newspapers there was no public. There were only people and uh, rulers uh, very rarely bothered to pass on their thinking to anybody other than their closest associates, and then only for utilitarian reasons. The notion of an observing citizenry somehow uh, uh, sharing the governance of society, this again is a print-created idea. Uh, the idea of interchangeable parts which it, without which our world would hardly function there would not be automobiles buildings aircraft interchangeable parts that's an idea that comes from the interchangeability of letters in a printer's block uh, if all that was the first industry to ever utilize the concept of uh, easily reformulated subunits. And it's strange, you know, the Chinese get credit for inventing printing thousands and thousands of years before Europe, but they would carve a single block of wood and print it. They didn't get the notion of movable type. And uh, movable type, the distribution of books becomes the paradigmatic model for the distribution of any product. You know, uh, you, it's produced, it's edited, it's uh, manufactured, it's sold, and then sequels are spawned. All products have followed this model, but books were one of the earliest mass manufactured objects to, to be put through this cycle. Modern city planning, the linearity of it, uh, the uh, way in which land surveys are carried out, these are all unconscious biases imbibed uh, from the world of print. And uh, they make sense if you're a print head. But one of the peculiar things, uh, notice that Animals do not possess language. 
uh, many human societies do not possess writing and very few human societies and only two on earth invented printing and yet once invented it feeds back into the evolution of social structures and defines everything and yet it's an extraordinary uh, artificiality and we have been imprisoned in it for hundreds and hundreds of years now now it is breaking down and uh, we are changing to a different sensory ratio and you might suppose if you hadn't given this a lot of thought that the new electronic media television and so forth would carry us into an entirely different sensory ratio McLuhan felt differently. He felt that it was restoring us to a medieval sensory ratio. He felt that a television screen is much more like an illuminated manuscript than a page of print. The distinction may seem subtle at first, but if, if you're looking at an illuminated medieval manuscript, notice I said looking, you must look in order to understand. Reading is not looking. Reading is an entirely different kind of behavior. As a child, you learn what an E looks like, what a printed lowercase e looks like. After seeing 20, 100, 1,000, 10,000, you know what it looks like. You have an expectation of the gestalt of the lowercase e, and nobody opens a book and looks at print unless there's some extraordinary abstract discussion going on. We read print, but we look at manuscript because manuscript carries the intrinsic signification of the individual who made it and his or her idiosyncrasies have to be parsed through to get the meaning. Similarly with television, television uh, is a very low resolution media. I mean, these are little pieces of light, pixels flying back and forth, and they must uh, be looked at. They cannot be read, uh, and it's an extraordinarily engaging process. It's, that's why it uh, uh, creates an entirely different set of social biases than print does. And McLuhan called these biases, and this was the one distinction or one idea of his that made its way into popular culture, he distinguished between what he called hot and cold media. And usually people botch this every time because nobody really to this day understands exactly uh, what he meant. So let me read you a little bit about this distinction. This is in chapter two of Understanding Media and chapter two is called Media Hot and Cold. The rise of the waltz, explained Kurt Sachs in The World History of the Dance, was a result of that longing for truth, simplicity, closeness to nature, and primitivism with which the last two-thirds of the 18th century fulfilled. In the century of jazz, we are likely to overlook the emergence of the waltz as a hot and explosive human expression that broke through the formal feudal barriers of courtly and choral dance styles. But obviously it was, I mean, when you contrast it to what came before. There is a basic principle that distinguishes a hot medium like radio from a cool one like the telephone, or a hot medium like the movie from a cool one like TV. A hot medium is one that extends one single sense in high definition. High definition is the state of being well filled with data. I love that. Uh, a photograph is visually high definition. A cartoon is low definition simply because very little visual information is provided. Telephone is a cool medium or one of low definition because the ear is given a meager amount of information. 
And speech is a cool medium of low definition because so little is given and so much has to be filled in by the listener. On the other hand, hot media do not leave so much to be filled in or completed by the audience. Hot media are, therefore, low in participation, and cool media are high in participation or completion by the audience. Naturally, therefore, a hot medium like the radio has very different effects on the user from a cool medium like the television. A cool medium, like hieroglyphic or ideogamic written characters, has very different effects from the hot and explosive medium of the phonetic alphabet. The alphabet, when pushed to a high degree of abstract visual intensity, became typography. The printed word, with its specialist intensity, burst the bonds of medieval corporate guilds and monasteries, creating extreme individualist patterns of enterprise and monopoly. But the typical reversal occurred when extremes of monopoly brought back the corporation with its impersonal empire over many lives. The hotting up of the medium of writing to repeatable prince intensity led to nationalism and the religious wars of the 16th century. The heavy and unwieldy media such as stone are time binders. Used for writing, they are very cool indeed and serve to unify the age, whereas paper is a hot medium that serves to unify spaces horizontally, both in political and entertainment empires. And he just goes on like this endlessly. I mean, this was his uh, metier or his media uh, to connect and comment um, on this stuff. And television really was his both his own media for reaching a very large audience. In fact, I remember the excitement that swept through. I didn't even have a television. I was living in Berkeley at the time, and somebody said, we, we have to go up to the student union at 6 o'clock because Mike Wallace is interviewing Marshall McLuhan. And it, it seemed an incredibly freaky notion that McLuhan would be on TV it, it shows you what a stultified, categorically different world we were living in uh, at the time. Uh, here's just a little bit of, uh, of McLuhan on television. This is chapter 31 of Understanding Media, The Timid Giant. Perhaps the most familiar and pathetic effect of the TV image is the posture of children in the early grades. Since TV, children, regardless of eye condition, average about six and a half inches from the printed page. Our children are striving to carry over to the printed page the all-involving sensory mandate of the TV image. With perfect psychomimetic skill, they carry out the commands of the TV image. They pour, they probe, they slow down and involve themselves in depth. This is what they had learned to do in the cool iconography of the comic book medium. TV carried the process much further. Suddenly they are transferred to the hot print medium with its uniform patterns and fast lineal movement. Pointlessly they strive to read print in depth. They bring to print all their senses and print rejects them. Print asks for the isolated and stripped down visual faculty not for the unified sensorium, you see. So often very unexpected paradoxical insights uh, emerge from this stuff. And in this book that he did with Harley Parker, Through the Vanishing Point, Space in Poetry and Painting, uh, it's an interesting technique. They take a number of works of art, either... Um, literature such as the song from Love's Labor Lost by William Shakespeare or the Ballade de Bon Conçu of Geoffrey Chaucer or the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam and then comment on it and also visual arts because McLuhan really felt that the art historical and 
technological and architectural output of Western civilization could be essentially psychoanalyzed, could be seen as the tracings of the mass consciousness. And the, uh, he felt that the evolution of sensory ratios within historical time had been very, very rapid. That, uh, for example, he talks about how St. Augustine was a person of great piety and learning, and uh, people doubting this would show him an open page of scripture or theological disputation. And he would look at it for a few moments, minutes, and then they would close the book and he could tell them what was written there. And this was taken as proof of his piety. He was, as far as we can tell, the only man in Europe who could read silently at that time. This was a period when the, the audio uh, pre-scribal uh, culture was still being assimilated. Uh, McLuhan spends a lot of time analyzing this episode in the 14th century when the laws of perspective spring suddenly into being. Uh, as uh, somewhat in the way, very similar in the way that fractal mathematics have introduced us to a new superspace. For the Renaissance, spatial perspective was essentially a filing system for visual data. At last, they knew where to put everything and where to look for it once they had put it there, which if you have a pre-perspectivist arrangement of space, you have to look, not read, look at, the, at each painting in order to locate where the information is. This is, again, this read-look dichotomy. McLuhan never discussed psychedelics, uh, but psychedelics, I think, clearly are an extension of these kinds of media that you have to engage with, that you have to look at, that you cannot read, you cannot take uh, for granted. And these give back uh, a, a much more complex world. I mean, notice that the world created by print is a world of gestalts, buildings, highways, bridges. We know how these things are supposed to look. We don't experience astonishment each time we enter a home or a, an institutional edifice. There is a built-in set of syntactical expectations in linear space. And when those are violated, this is very noticeable and becomes the basis for architectural or design innovation or something like that. I think that what's happening, and I think that this would be McLuhan's take, is that uh, all of these new media that attempt to suppress the appurtenances of media are in fact having the effect of returning us to an archaic sensory ratio. And McLuhan was on to this. He is the one who coined the phrase electronic feudalism. And he felt that, that we were headed back toward the medieval sensory ratio because he saw television as like manuscript. But I think had he lived into the era of VR, psilocybin, HDTV, and implants, he would have seen we're not reaching back to the medieval. That was simply a stepping stone to the archaic and that we are going beyond the entire domain of scribal humanity and actually reaching back to a shamanic, uh, feeling-toned kind of thing. And all of the breakdown of linearity that you see in the 20th century, abstract expressionism, da-da, jazz, rock and roll, uh, non-figure painting, LSD, all of these things on one level can be seen as, uh, as I've said, as harking back to uh, the archaic. But on, on another level, what they can be seen as are uh, new 
behaviors emerging as the cloud of print constellated constipation is is lifted it's breaking down an interesting question that we would put to McLuhan if we had him here tonight I think is is to what degree can what he said about television not be applied to HDTV it seems to me that HDTV is television without the biases of TV and you know a perfect medium is an invisible a perfect media is an invisible media and print is the least invisible of all media. I mean, print is an incredible uh, Rude, Rude Goldberg invention for, for uh, conveying information. Uh, here's McLuhan on this same subject rather than me dwelling on it. This is from the Gutenberg Galaxy. This is a, a section called A Theory of Cultural Change is Impossible Without Knowledge of the Changing Sense Ratios Affected by Various Externalizations of Our Senses, in other words, by media. It is very much worth dwelling on this matter, since we can see that from the invention of the alphabet, there has been a continuous drive in the Western world toward the separation of the senses, of functions, of operations, of states emotional and political, as well as of tasks, a fragmentation which terminated, thought Durkheim, in the anomie of the 19th century. The paradox presented by Professor von Bexy is that the two-dimensional mosaic is in fact a multidimensional world of interstructural resonance. It is the three-dimensional world of pictorial space that is indeed an abstract illusion built on the intense separation of the visual from the other senses. There is here no question of values or preferences. It is necessary, however, for any other kind of understanding to know why primitive drawing is two-dimensional, whereas the drawing and painting of literate human beings tends toward perspective. Without this knowledge, we cannot grasp why people ever cease to be primitive or audio-tactile in their sense bias, nor could we ever understand why men have sense saison, that's in quotes, abandoned the visual in favor of the audio-tactile modes of awareness and, and of organization of experience. This matter clarified, we can much more easily approach the role of alphabet and of printing in giving a dominant role to the visual sense in language and art and in the entire range of social and political life. For until we have upgraded the visual component, communities know only a tribal structure. The detribalizing of the individual has, in the past at least, depended on an intense visual life fostered by literacy and by literacy of the alphabetic kind alone. For alphabetic writing is not unique, but late. There had been much writing before it. In fact, any people that ceases to be nomadic and pursues sedentary modes of work is ready to invent writing. No merely nomadic people ever had writing any more than they ever developed architecture or enclosed space. For writing is a visual enclosure of non-visual spaces and senses. It is therefore an abstraction of the visual from the ordinary sense interplay. And whereas speech is an outering, utterance, of all our senses at once, writing abstracts from speech. That's very interesting, isn't it? That this uh, association of nomadism to the inability to create architectonic space and therefore no writing. That a word is a structure, a written word is a structure, and therefore no nomad would ever uh, do such a thing. Interesting. I think he's saying reading is not seeing. And those who read do not see. Even when they lift their eyes from their books, they, they, they carry the attitude of print into the world. They read, they attempt to read nature. 
And you can't read nature. You must look at nature. You must see nature. Certainly, I think in my own life, I was thinking about this a few months ago, and it surprised me. I'm trying to think of the books that really influenced my life, and I thought of, you know, Moby Dick and mm, Huxley's Doors of Perception. But then when I really got down on it, I realized that a little tiny book Huxley wrote that my mother pushed on me when I was about 12 years old called The Art of Seeing probably shaped me as much as anything. And in there, it's a very McLuhan-esque rap without McLuhan-esque terminology. And he says the way to overcome, and I think this is very, very, very intelligent and simple advice, Huxley said the way to overcome the print bias, and God knows, he was a Cambridge educated gentleman steeped in the traditions of English literacy and intellectualism, is uh, freehand drawing. Draw. Train your eye. Draw nudes. Draw seashells. Draw insects. and plant. Go into nature and train the eye to see, and you will cease to read the world. And r readers are emotionally... A person, a seeing person, does not want to form a relationship with a reading person. The, you know this conflict that we get between men and women and between people about which we call the head-heart conflict is really a reading-seeing conflict. It isn't a head and heart. It's that, it's that readers and seers cannot relate to each other's emotional life because they seem to come from uh, such different worlds. So yeah, I think you have a, a, a very good point. And the, the permission to abstract from nature that print created is why we have such a terrible culture crisis. You know, because, uh, uh, well, f just a kind of a trivial example, you know, it was said by Marshall McLuhan, strangely enough, that the Vietnam War could not be won the way an ordinary war is won because the, the citizenry of this country couldn't tolerate the sight of what war was and that m modern warfare became impossible when it could be televised into the living room. Because war is something that you must read about. You must not see it. It must be this grand thing of the distant clash of armies and young heroes being created. But when it turns into amputation and maggots and screams of pain, the political fun goes out of it. So war is therefore a literary activity. And, you know, the one argument that can be made, I think, in television's favor is people don't like to see images of violence. But if we have to show so much violence on television, let it always be real. The violence is only indefensible when it's vicarious. If it's real violence, you need to see it because it's happening in a world for which you bear a partial moral responsibility. And I, I think warfare has been remade uh, by media in that sense. A lot of politics has been remade because imperial doings are usually ugly, brutal, and not something that you want to exhibit before the populace. And yet uh, modern media makes that uh, very difficult to avoid. You know, you get the notion of public morality or, you know, the people won't stand for this. We have to get this story out. The people won't stand for this. Well, now, this is a moral dimension inconceivable in, in medieval or Roman times. I mean, what would it mean to say the people won't stand for this? So there's an attempt to create, through the collectivity, a kind of community of moral, uh, of moral judgment. The medium is the message, means that the medium is the thing which is making the difference. In all, every discussion you ever hear since the 60s about TV, for example, is it good, is it bad, terrible, wonderful, the, always the discussion hinges around 
what's on TV. And people say, well, television is terrible, it just shows violence, and then somebody else says, no, television is wonderful, those nature shows and news from far away and masterpiece theater. This is a stupid argument. It, I, the, what McLuhan meant by the, messi the, the media is the message is he meant that it doesn't matter what you put on TV. TV is TV. It has an intrinsic nature. And whether you're showing National Geographic specials or slasher movies, TV will do what it does. It has certain qualities, just like driving a car or skiing. Certain muscles are going to be exercised, certain uh, perceptual systems enhanced, others suppressed. And uh, it's, it, it's very hard for us to understand this because because we have accepted this media so thoroughly into our life. But in fact, it is shaping our value systems uh, in ways that are very hard for us to suspect or, or even, uh, e even detect. I mean, television, for example, uh, it's a drug. It, it has a series of measurable physiological parameters that are as... Uh, intrinsically its signature as the parameters of heroin are its signature. I mean, you sit somebody down in front of a TV set and turn it on, 20 minutes later come back, sample their blood pressure, their eye movement rate, uh, blood is pooling in their rear end, uh, their breathing takes on a certain quality, the stare reflex sets in. I mean, they are thoroughly zoned on a drug. And when you think about the fact that si the average American watches six and a half hours of television a day, imagine if a drug had been introduced in 1948 that we all spent six and a half hours per day on average watching. And the one thing about drugs in their defense is that it's very hard to diddle the message. A drug is a mirror. But television isn't a mirror. Television is a billboard. And anybody who pays uh, their money can put their message into the trip. This is an extraordinarily uh, insidious situation. What McLuhan wanted to become, I think, was the founder of a general uh, new sophistication about media. And he was essentially parodied to get to death by, guess what, media. They made of him an icon of cultural incomprehensibility. Not since Einstein has somebody, have you been so pre-programmed in advance to believe you ain't going to understand this guy. And that's what they said about McLuhan. And consequently, uh, his... Uh, his message and his insight failed. Uh, we will have to reinvent McLuhan around the turn of the century because we are producing forms of media of such interactive uh, power and potential social impact that we're going to have to go back and, uh, and rethink all of this.